Hello, this is Michael Silva with Silva Consultants. Today's presentation is on protecting apartments, condominiums, and gated communities. This presentation is intended to give you some guidelines for providing effective security at multifamily properties. The information contained in this presentation is expanded upon in considerably greater detail in my book called Protecting Apartments, Condominiums, and Gated Communities, a guide to security for homeowners associations and property managers. This book is available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle format. In today's presentation, we're going to cover five topics. First, we're going to talk about the reasons to provide good security at your multifamily property. Second, we're going to talk about using a risk-based approach in your security planning. Third, we're going to discuss some basic security principles that should be the foundation of putting together your security plan. Fourth, we're going to cover some common security problems that are found at multifamily properties and offer some solutions to solving them. And finally, we're going to talk about putting together your overall security plan. So, what are the reasons to provide good security at a multifamily property? This is something that seems obvious, but is worthy of a little further thought. The number one priority of most security programs is to provide safety and security for residents and guests. While nothing can absolutely guarantee security, management and owners should make every reasonable effort to keep residents safe and secure. Another reason to provide good security at your multifamily property is to maintain the quality of life in the community. Perception is just as important as reality. Crime statistics may indicate that your property has a relatively low rate of crime. However, if residents don't feel safe, you have a problem. Reducing losses due to theft and vandalism is another good reason to provide security at a multifamily property. Repeated thefts and vandalism cost money and can prevent you from making needed investments elsewhere. Thefts and vandalisms can also deny residents the use of needed amenities and further contribute to an unsafe environment at a multifamily property. Keeping your property from getting a bad reputation is another reason to provide good security at your multifamily property. This is particularly true at rental properties, where renters dissatisfied with security can post negative reviews on sites such as Yelp or apartment ratings. Having too many negative reviews can affect the rentability of your property and drive away the most desirable tenants. Reducing exposure to negligent security lawsuits is another reason to provide good security at your multifamily property. Negligent security is when a person gets hurt or suffers a loss and claims it was due to having inadequate security at the property. Concern about negligent security claims can be one of the biggest drivers in making security improvements at a multifamily property today. Settling a negligent security claim averages about a half a million dollars, and the average jury award in negligent security cases is usually more than a million dollars. Just the cost of defending a property against a negligent security claim is usually $100,000 or more. Here are some things that can get property owners and managers in trouble. Many of my security consultant colleagues make a good living serving as experts to attorneys who are suing property owners and managers for negligent security. The basis of these lawsuits is that the property had a duty to provide security, but failed to take reasonable steps to fulfill those obligations. The following slides talk about some common basis for negligent security lawsuits. Any one of these alone may not make you vulnerable, but should be seen as red flags. If any of these apply to you, you should review the matter with your attorney to see if you have exposure and then take the appropriate corrective actions. As a property owner or manager, you have a duty to know what's going on. However, it is surprising just how many property owners or managers can't accurately tell you the history of crime at their properties. You should keep an accurate written record of all crimes and security incidents that have occurred at your property for at least the last three years. If no crimes were committed, you should document this also. Not knowing the level of crime at your property can get you in trouble. In addition to knowing what's happening at your own specific property, you also have a duty to know what's going on in your neighborhood. This is because what's going on elsewhere in the neighborhood can have a direct impact on your security risks. If you don't know the crimes being committed in the areas around you, 
how can you possibly design a security program to prevent them? Not being aware of crimes being committed in the surrounding neighborhood can get you in trouble. Every complaint from residents about security should be taken seriously. When necessary, the appropriate corrective action should be taken to address the resident's complaint. All communications concerning complaints and any corrective actions taken should be thoroughly documented in writing. Ignoring complaints from residents can get you into trouble. You must keep residents aware of any security problems that are occurring on the property. Many owners and property managers are reluctant to do this and make statements such as, we don't want to scare residents or we don't want them to think that this property is unsafe. Keeping residents in the dark about security problems can get you in trouble. Be honest and open and err on the side of oversharing rather than undersharing. You should have a written plan for security at the property. This plan can be very simple, but should match what is actually being done at the property and be up to date. Fully document in writing what you do and don't do in terms of security at the property. Make sure that everyone clearly understands this plan. Not having a written security plan can get you in trouble. Once you have established a written security plan, be sure that you follow it. Having an old plan that still exists but isn't being followed can be a problem from a liability perspective. Keep in mind that emails, memos, and job descriptions can also be considered to be informal parts of your property's security plans. For example, if you have something in writing that states that a security officer is supposed to make hourly patrols of the parking lot, and this rarely, if ever, happens, this can create a problem. If you say you're going to do something, be sure that you do it or revise the documentation so that it doesn't continue to make inaccurate claims. Not following a previously written security plan can get you in trouble. You must maintain any existing security measures that are already in place. Having burned out lights, doors and gates that fail to close and lock properly, or things such as security cameras that don't work correctly can be an easy way to prove negligence. You should inspect your property regularly and promptly fix things that aren't working. Repairs should always be made in days, not in weeks or months. If an important security measure, such as an overhead door on a parking garage entrance, can't be repaired right away, it may be necessary to take steps such as hiring a temporary security officer to observe the garage entrance until the door can be fixed. Not maintaining existing security measures can get you in trouble. You should be aware of what other multifamily properties in your community are doing in terms of security. If many similar properties are doing something, this can set an informal standard of care or best practice for multifamily properties in your community. If you face the same risk of crime as other properties in your community, but are doing far less in terms of security, you had better be able to explain why. You should never oversell the level of security provided at your property. Real estate agents and leasing agents, anxious to sell or lease a property, sometimes misrepresent the amount of security that is provided. Keep in mind that even when the best of security measures are put into place, you can never completely eliminate crime or guarantee absolute security for residents and guests. All parties involved should clearly understand this and not have unrealistic expectations about the level of security provided at your property. Cutting security measures just to save money can get property owners and managers in trouble. Common examples of cost cutting can include eliminating staffing at a gatehouse or concierge desk or eliminating 24 hour security patrols at a property. Once a security measure is put into place, it should generally only be removed if there is a substantial reduction in the level of security risk that the property faces or if a different but equally effective type of security measure is put into place as a substitute. Any reductions in security measures solely for cost savings reasons should be carefully thought out to avoid liability. We are now going to talk about the ways that security at your property should be planned. Within the following slides, we are going to discuss the way that security has traditionally been planned and compare it with a risk-based security planning approach that we recommend. 
Security has traditionally been planned by doing what has always been done. New security plans are created by simply copying old ones. Things continue to be done regardless of how effective or ineffective they may be. Most traditional security plans are created on a piecemeal basis in response to specific security problems that have occurred over time. New measures are put into place one by one to plug gaps in security without the benefit of any type of long-term planning effort. Traditional security plans often place an emphasis on quick fixes, things that are inexpensive temporary measures that can be quickly implemented, rather than on things that are permanent solutions. Finally, because of the reactionary nature of this type of planning, the security plan is always focused on solving yesterday's problems rather than looking into the future. We believe that using a risk-based approach to planning security is a far better method to ensure the long-term success of the security program at a multifamily property. The premise of this approach is very simple. Every security measure should be in response to one or more specific security risks. Just as a doctor would not begin to prescribe medications before diagnosing the disease, the risk-based approach suggests that security measures should not be employed until all security risks have been accurately identified and assessed. Using the risk-based approach involves four steps. Step one is to conduct a security risk assessment to identify and prioritize your security risks. Step two is to determine the best types of security measures to mitigate those risks identified in the risk assessment. Step three is to implement security measures to address your highest priority security risks first. Step four is to then implement measures to deal with lower priority security risks. This can be done over time or as additional funding becomes available. There are numerous resources available online that provide additional information on conducting security risk assessments. Additional information is also available in my book on multifamily security that was mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. An independent security consultant can also be hired to conduct a risk assessment and assist with the development of a security plan. We are now going to talk about four basic security principles that should be considered when planning your security program. These principles include the three D's of security, the balanced approach to security, concentric circles of protection, and crime prevention through environmental design, commonly known as SEPTED. The three D's of security are deter, detect, and delay. These principles should be considered when deciding what types of security measures to use at your multifamily property. Deter. The first objective of the security program should be to discourage the criminal from choosing your property as a target in the first place. Criminals pick targets that offer the most reward with the least amount of effort. Criminals also don't want to be seen or apprehended. Things that make the criminal think that a crime will take too much time to carry out and things that make the criminal think that he or she will get caught can cause the criminal to move along to another property. Detect. The second objective of the security program should be to detect the criminal's presence as quickly as possible when he or she enters the property. Criminals can be detected by being observed by a resident or employee or being detected by an electronic detection system. Delay. The third objective of the security program should be to delay the criminal as he or she attempts to carry out a crime. The longer the criminal is on the property, the better the chances that he or she will get caught. Things that delay the criminal can reduce the amount of damage that can be caused and increase the likelihood that the criminal will flee before fully carrying out the intended crime. The balanced approach to security is a philosophy that states that every security program needs to be made up of three elements. These three elements are operational security measures, electronic security systems, and site and building features. All elements must be used together in order to provide effective security. No element can stand alone or provide adequate security on its own. 
A common mistake is to install one type of security measure, such as security cameras, while neglecting other types of security measures, such as policies and procedures, or providing security awareness training for residents. An important concept for providing good security at a multifamily property is known as concentric circles of protection. This concept involves the use of multiple layers of security. The first layer is located at the site perimeter and additional layers are provided as you move inward through the property. This concept is illustrated in the diagram shown and is sometimes compared to the layers of an onion. When the concentric circles of protection concept is used to protect a property, the criminal must penetrate a series of layers to reach his or her intended target. While breaching a single layer may be possible, having to breach additional layers makes gaining entry exponentially more difficult. The more layers that exist, the more difficult it is for the criminal to gain entry. Having multiple layers decreases the probability that the intruder will be able to successfully gain access. Security can be improved by adding layers, increasing the effectiveness of each layer, or a combination of both. Relying on a single layer is almost never effective because it requires that layer to be perfect, a goal that is almost always unattainable. Crime prevention through environmental design, also known as SEPTED, is a recognized crime prevention strategy. SEPTED promotes several different theories which include natural surveillance, natural access control, territorial reinforcement, and maintenance. SEPTED strategies should be used in developing your security plan. There is a ton of information on the internet about SEPTED, so we are not going to duplicate it here, but we encourage you to do your research on the ways that SEPTED can help to improve security at your multifamily property. The next section of this presentation will focus on some common problems that we see when conducting security assessments at multifamily properties. This information is based on our experience in having conducted close to 2,000 assessments over the last 35 years. Depending on your type of property, some of these issues may or may not apply to you. The topics are presented in no particular order. Tailgating at parking garage entrances is a big problem at multifamily properties. Tailgating is when someone sneaks into the garage as a vehicle enters or exits. Tailgating at garage entrances can be reduced by educating residents to wait for the door to fully close before driving off. Tailgating can also be reduced by reducing the amount of time that the door stays open. More advanced solutions to tailgating include the use of high-speed overhead doors, which can close in as fast as six seconds, and multi-gate sally port arrangements. Tailgating at building entrances is also a significant problem. Most people's natural instincts are to be courteous and helpful, and this includes holding a door open for others. Tailgating can be a particular problem at buildings that have many users with no particular allegiance to the property. This can include short-term renters, delivery drivers, and visitors. Preventing tailgating at building entrances can be a challenge. Strategies to solve this problem can include providing continual security awareness training to residents, providing signs at the doors as reminders not to let unknown people into the building keeping access control door unlock times set to a minimum, and setting automatic door openers so that they only stay open for a minimum amount of time. More advanced solutions can include the use of anti-tailgating devices such as sally ports, security revolving doors, or optical turnstiles. To learn more about these devices, a qualified security professional should be consulted. Many doors and latches are easy to force open. This can especially be a problem at doors with electric strikes, where the dead latching feature fails to operate correctly. When conducting assessments, we find that the dead latch feature doesn't work properly on as many as 80% of the doors that we examine. This allows the latch to be easily pushed back, allowing entry. The solution to this problem is to provide a latch guard or full height security astragal on the door. A latch guard is good, 
but a full height astrocol is much better as it provides full protection of the gap between the door and the door frame. Most wood doors and frames can be easily kicked in by an intruder. This is a common way that burglars use to break into residential units and storage rooms. Sometimes only a quarter inch or less of thin wood holds the strike plate in place. This allows the door to be open with just one or two swift kicks. The solution to this problem is to install a door and frame reinforcement kit. Door and frame reinforcement kits greatly increase the strength of the door and frame, making it much more difficult to kick in the door. Many outswinging doors can be opened by simply removing the hinge pins, allowing the door to be swung open from the hinge side. This is a common burglary technique used on storage room doors at multifamily properties. The solution to this problem is to provide security studs on the hinges. These devices hold the hinge together even if the hinge pin is removed. Security studs can be purchased online and at many local hardware outlets. Clever burglars use what is known as an underdoor tool to open doors from the outside. This tool is inserted in the gap beneath the door and is used to operate the inside lever handle of the lock, causing the door to unlock. This tool can be bought online and homemade versions of this tool can be made using instructions found on the internet. The use of this tool can sometimes explain why items are missing from a locked room with no signs of forced entry. This problem can be reduced by eliminating the gap at the bottom of the door. This is done by installing standard thresholds and door bottoms to create a tight seal at the bottom of the door. There are also special door bottoms available that are specifically designed for security purposes. Another tool used by burglars is known as the double door tool. This tool is specifically designed to work on double doors that are secured using exit devices. Double door tools are inserted in the gap between the door leaves and are used to activate the push bar on the inside of the door. Double door tools are available for sale online and homemade versions of this tool can also be made. The use of the double door tool can be prevented by installing an astragal to cover the gap between the doors. Several types of astragals are available depending on the type of the door. Please note that installing an astragal may also require the use of a door coordinator so that the doors close in the proper sequence. Door locks and lock cylinders can be forced open using a wrench. Most cylindrical locks and mortise lock cylinders are vulnerable to this type of an attack. This vulnerability can be reduced by adding devices to provide better protection of the lock or lock cylinder. These devices can include knob guards, lever guards, and cylinder guards. Doors that are secured using electromagnetic locks most often use motion detectors to unlock the door as people exit from the inside. Burglars have learned to activate these motion detectors from outside of the door to gain entry. This can be done by inserting an object through a crack to activate the motion sensor or by blowing air or smoke through the crack. The use of canned air to open doors in this manner has been shown in numerous videos on the internet. The first thing to do is to try to relocate or adjust the motion detector so that it is more difficult to activate from outside the door. If this doesn't solve the problem, consider the use of additional or alternative request to exit devices such as touch sense bars or photo beams. Standard locks are easy to compromise using techniques such as lock bumping, lock picking, and lock raking. Picking tools and bump keys are readily available online and instructional videos on how to use these tools can be found all over YouTube. Standard keys can be copied almost anywhere, making it impossible for you to know how many keys are in circulation at any one time. The best solution to this problem is to use a high security lock and key system. High security locks are much more difficult to pick or bump open and offer much more protection against drilling. 
The distribution of high security keys is much more tightly controlled, making it difficult for unauthorized copies of these keys to be ordered. At multifamily properties, it is recommended that high security locks be used on the building entrance doors and on the doors to common areas. For best security, high security locks should also be used on the doors to the individual residential units. It should be kept in mind that no type of lock is pick proof. There are champion locksmiths who can pick anything. With that being said, picking high security locks is beyond the capabilities of most common criminals. 90% of the access cards and fobs in use today at multifamily properties use what is known as 125 kilohertz proximity technology. This technology has been around for over 25 years. Unfortunately, 125 kilohertz cards and fobs can now be easily copied using devices available online for as little as $30. It is also possible to copy these cards and fobs at self-service kiosks located in malls and using online key cloning sites. Unfortunately, the only real solution to this problem is to upgrade your card readers, cards, and fobs to the new higher security type. One example of such a product is the HID COS. If you are adding new card readers to your system, be sure that they are compatible with a new, higher security type of cards and fobs. The use of PIN codes or personal identification numbers to gain entry to a building or site can create security vulnerabilities. PIN codes can easily be shared either intentionally or unintentionally. Once a PIN code is given out, it cannot be taken back. Criminals who learn PIN codes often share them with others in the criminal community. PIN codes can often be guessed, particularly if a predictable numbering scheme such as years of birth or years of graduation are used. Some criminals have been known to use binoculars specifically for the purpose of observing PIN codes from a distance. It is preferable for residents and contractors to use access cards rather than PIN codes. If possible, eliminate the use of PIN codes entirely. If PIN codes continue to be used, we suggest the following. Don't use a common code that is shared by multiple users. Instead, provide individual PIN codes to each user, including each individual resident and each individual contractor employee. Use a random rather than predictable scheme to create PIN codes. If your access control system allows it, generate a report showing the times and days that each PIN code is used. Audit this report to make sure that the access shown is reasonable and appropriate given your circumstances. For example, a contractor who is supposed to be working in the building only during the weekdays should not be accessing the building at night or on weekends. Finally, Change PIN codes on a regularly scheduled basis or immediately when it is suspected that a code has been compromised. Most simple key boxes used to store keys or access cards outside of buildings are easy to break into. Techniques for quickly decoding most types of key boxes are shown on the internet. There is a potential for intruders to make repeated entries into the building with no signs of forced entry using this technique. The best solution is to discontinue the use of key boxes entirely. Issue vendors who require entry access cards or provide a means for someone to let them into the building. If key boxes are used, their use should be actively managed by the property management team. Residents should not be allowed to place key boxes that contain common area keys or access fobs without permission of the property manager. Property management and maintenance staff should always be on the lookout for unauthorized key boxes put up by residents. Many telephone entry systems can be easily compromised by an intruder. Most of these systems are equipped with a standard factory lock that is the same for all buildings across the country. Keys to these locks can be ordered online. Many criminals carry these keys on their key ring. This key can be used to open the front panel of the telephone entry unit. Once open, 
the postal lock switch can be activated, allowing entry into the building. To make your telephone entry unit more secure, replace the standard factory lock with a high security lock keyed uniquely to your property. For even greater security, install an external padlock on the face of the unit or physically strengthen the unit with a protective metal shroud. Outdoor key switches are often used at overhead doors and gates. These key switches are sometimes required by the fire department or a utility company. In most cases, the cover to these key switches is mounted using standard screws. Intruders can easily remove these covers and short the wiring to gain entry. The first thing to do is to confirm that the key switch is really needed in the first place. In many cases, the key switch is installed as part of a construction project, but is seldom if ever used. If the key switch is needed, use tamper resistant screws to mount the cover plate to prevent it from being removed using a standard tool. If your building has an alarm system, consider installing a tamper switch on the key switch so that an alarm is received when the key switch is tampered with. The lock hardware used on many exterior gates can be easily compromised. This can be accomplished by inserting a tool to activate the inside lever or push bar, by tampering with the latch, or by prying open the gate with a screwdriver or pry bar. Exterior gates can be made more secure by doing the following. Adding lever guards to protect the inside handle of the lock. Adding a protective guard around exit devices to prevent activation of the push bar from the outside. Adding screening on the surrounding fence to prevent access to the lock hardware on the inside of the gate. And by adding steel plates on the latch side edge of the gate to prevent prying and tampering with the latch. Signage and graphics advertise locations of valuable assets to criminals. This makes it easy for them to quickly find what they are looking for. Identification signs and graphics should be removed from rooms that contain valuable assets. If desired, signs with room numbers only can be provided. The people who need to use these rooms should know their locations, and there is no need to advertise what's inside the room to others. Burglaries of resident storage rooms is a big problem at many multifamily properties. This is largely due to the inadequate security that is typically provided at resident storage facilities. To improve security at storage rooms, you should treat doors to storage rooms as exterior doors. Provide security asterisks, door and frame reinforcements, and thresholds and door bottoms. If the door to the storage room is card reader controlled, consider the use of an electric lock rather than an electric strike, as an electric lock provides better security and increased resistance to forced entry. The type of storage locker system used has a great impact on the level of security provided in a storage room. This photo shows the types of lockers commonly used at multifamily properties and the relative amount of security that they provide. At properties that are experiencing lots of storage locker theft, sometimes the best solution is to upgrade the type of storage locker system used. Regardless of the types of systems used, residents should understand the limited amount of security that storage lockers can provide and never store extremely valuable items here. Poor bicycle racks and inadequate locks make it easy to steal bicycles at many multifamily properties. Most bike racks are not designed for security and can easily be compromised by a bicycle thief. Many racks are not bolted to the wall or floor, allowing the rack along with the bicycles attached to it to be easily removed. Many racks are assembled with standard fasteners that allow the rack to be easily taken apart using common tools. The majority of bike locks used by residents can be easily defeated. Combination type locks and cable type locks are especially vulnerable. To provide better protection of bicycles, it is recommended that bicycle racks that have been specifically designed for security use be used. These bicycle racks should be securely mounted to the walls or floors using tamper-resistant fasteners. 
Any fasteners used to assemble the racks should be tack welded in place or high security fasteners should be used. Residents should be encouraged to use high quality U-lock type bicycle locks. Package theft is a huge problem at multifamily properties today. The popularity of online shopping has exponentially increased the number of packages being received. At buildings with on-site staff, staff can become overwhelmed with package activity, causing other duties to be neglected. Package theft is a big cause of resident complaints and negative reviews being posted on online rating sites. To provide better security of packages, avoid leaving packages in unsecured areas such as lobbies. Provide a secured package room if possible. If having a secured package room is not possible, consider providing a manual package storage locker with a combination lock. The code to this lock would be given to delivery drivers and residents. While not perfect, this system provides better security than simply leaving packages unsecured in the lobby. For best security, consider the use of an automatic package locker system. Elevators provide a relatively weak line of security and can be easily compromised. It is usually very easy for an intruder to follow a resident onto the elevator and ride along with them to a secured floor. The busier that the elevators are, the easier it is to do this. It is also possible to call an elevator and wait inside the car until it is called to a secured floor. For example, an intruder can sneak into a parking garage, call an elevator, and then wait inside the car until it is called to a secured floor. When doing security assessments, we often try this technique and find that we can usually get to a secured floor in just a few minutes. Here are some tips for improved elevator security. First, Avoid relying on elevators as your only line of security defense. Provide secured elevator lobbies or intervening doors that are locked where possible. When card readers are used to control elevators, require the use of an access card to both call the elevator and to gain access to the residential floor. Residents will be required to use their access card twice, once to call the elevator and then again inside the elevator car to select their floor. Educate residents so they are aware of the security vulnerabilities associated with elevators. Many buildings are designed so that there is an inherent conflict between life safety requirements and security requirements. For example, in this diagram, the emergency exits off of a parking garage floor are located in the residential portion of the building. To exit the parking garage, people must be able to travel into the residential area. This prevents the door between the garage and the residential hallway from being locked. Anyone who sneaks into the parking garage has unrestricted access to the residential floors. This can be a challenging problem to solve. First, attempt to obtain special permission to lock the door from your local building officials. If allowed, this may require the installation of an emergency release button, connection to the building's fire alarm system, or both. Be sure to obtain permission first. At many buildings, you will see doors of this type locked in violation of building codes. If permission has not been obtained, this could create liability. Just because it hasn't been caught by an inspector previously doesn't make it legal. If codes do not allow the door to be locked, consider providing an exit alarm on the door with card reader bypass. This allows residents to enter but will sound an alarm if the door is open without the use of a valid access card. Another conflict between life safety requirements and security requirements is when the same stairway is used for exiting from both the parking garage floors and the residential floors. For example, in this diagram, a stairway is used to allow people to exit from the parking garage to the street. People enter the stairway and then travel up to ground level where they can exit to the street. This same stairway is used to exit from the residential floors above. To exit a residential floor, a person enters the stairway and travels down to ground level to exit to the street. This scenario creates a security vulnerability in that anyone who sneaks into the parking garage can enter the stairway and have unrestricted access to the residential floors.
This, too, can be a challenging problem to solve. First, attempt to obtain special permission from building officials to lock the doors from the garage to the stairs. If allowed, this may require the installation of an emergency release button, connection to the building's fire alarm system, or both. If the doors to the stairway cannot be locked, provide exit alarms on the doors. If residents need to use the doors, provide a card reader to allow residents to bypass the alarm. If space permits, consider installing a gate in the stairway just above the exit floor. This would allow people to exit from the upper floors of the building, but prevent an intruder from traveling up to the residential floors. Be sure to obtain permission from local building officials before installing this gate. In some cases, the installation of a gate would reduce the required clearances in the stairway and would not be allowed. If access to the stairway cannot be controlled by other means, locking the stairway doors at the residential floor should be considered. If desired, these doors can be equipped with a card reader. People could freely exit into the stairway at any time, but a valid access card would be required to enter the floor from the stairway. It is important to point out that locking doors on residential floors can create a new set of challenges, particularly at high-rise buildings. This may require connection of the doors to the fire alarm system, provisions for re-entry every certain number of floors, and the installation of special communication systems in the stairways. Once again, local building code officials should be consulted to determine exactly what is required before making any changes. At many multifamily properties, landscaping prevents natural surveillance of the property. This provides places for people to hide and can allow criminals to commit their crimes without being observed. It is recommended that landscaping be maintained using recognized crime prevention through environmental design or SEPTED principles. This involves limiting the height of shrubbery to a height of no higher than three feet and trimming tree canopies so that they are no lower than six feet. Landscaping should also be trimmed so that it does not block light fixtures or obstruct the view of surveillance cameras. Poor lighting can be a problem at many multifamily properties. Poor lighting can create an unsafe environment for residents and guests. Inadequate lighting has also been used as the basis for many negligent security lawsuits. It is recommended that a minimum light level of between 1 and 3 foot candles, or 10 to 30 lux, be provided in all areas unless higher light levels are specified by code. Lighting should be consistent throughout the area, avoiding situations where it is very bright in some areas but very dark in others. We recommend a lighting uniformity ratio that does not exceed 4 to 1, average to minimum, throughout the entire area. Clear white light is best for security purposes. The use of LED light fixtures is recommended as they are highly efficient and offer energy savings. So, what about security cameras? Aren't they a great way to prevent crime at a multifamily property? Video surveillance systems, also known as closed circuit television systems or security camera systems, are widely used at multifamily properties. It is our opinion that video surveillance systems are the most overused and wrongly applied type of security measure. Video surveillance systems are often used as a quick fix or feel good measure in response to security problems. We feel that video surveillance systems can be a useful tool as part of an overall security program, but are never a security solution in themselves. Despite commonly held beliefs, Cameras are not a proven deterrent to most common criminals. This is because most people who engage in criminal behavior don't have the same thought processes that honest people do and don't consider the long-term consequences of their actions. Also, many people who commit crimes aren't thinking rationally at the time that they commit them. They may be drunk, high on drugs, or suffering from some form of mental illness. Smart criminals are well aware of the limitations of video surveillance systems and may plan their crimes around them. They may commit crimes just outside of the range of cameras or wear simple disguises to conceal their identity. People become desensitized to the presence of video cameras after a short period of time. While there may be an awareness of the cameras when they are first installed, they soon become part of the environment. 
making regular occupants of the area almost oblivious to their presence. Much recorded video provides insufficient detail to positively identify suspects. Many law enforcement agencies lack the resources to investigate and prosecute minor property crimes, even if good images of the perpetrators are available. Many criminals know this and blatantly commit crimes in front of video cameras, knowing that there is little chance they will ever be caught or prosecuted. Security cameras work best in small, well-defined areas that have good lighting. Examples include interior building entrances, lobbies and vestibules, elevators, and short hallways. Security cameras can face challenges when covering large open areas and areas with poor or uneven lighting. These areas can include parking lots and parking garages, swimming pools, outdoor courtyards, along alleyways or streets, and down long hallways. Surveillance systems can be designed to provide effective coverage of these areas, but this often requires spending more money than most property owners want to spend. Often, owners will attempt to compromise by installing only a single camera to cover a very large area. This usually provides disappointing results. Here are some tips for using video surveillance systems. Understand that video surveillance systems should only be one part of your overall security plan. Have specific measurable goals for the video surveillance system before you buy it. Be skeptical of claims made by vendors that appear to be too good to be true. Make sure that residents know the purpose and limitations of the video surveillance system, including the areas that it covers and the areas that it does not. Finally, have a written policy regarding the use of the video surveillance system. This policy should include language concerning who does and does not have access to the video recordings produced by the system. Let's talk now about how you can put together an overall security plan for your multifamily property. First, Conduct a security risk assessment to identify and prioritize your security risks. Second, assess the present security program at your property to see how well it is working in terms of reducing your security risks. Identify any deficiencies or weakness in your existing systems and procedures. Third, identify ways in which the deficiencies in your existing program can be corrected. Develop specific recommendations for things that can be done to improve security. Arrange these recommendations in order of priority, addressing your highest priority security risks first. Fourth, put a plan into place to implement your recommendations. Assign responsibility for implementing recommendations to specific groups or individuals and establish a timeline for their completion. And fifth, execute your plan. Here are some closing thoughts. First, take a proactive approach in managing security. Plan your security program in advance rather than in response to each new security incident or problem. Understand that good security is a process, not a product. You can't buy your way out of this by purchasing a single product or service. You must put in the work to develop and implement a comprehensive security program for your property. There are no magic bullets. If something seems to be too good to be true, it probably is. Resident security awareness is crucial to success. You need to make residents part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Training residents about security is one of the single most effective things that you can do to improve security at your property. Security threats are always evolving, so your security plan must keep evolving also. Stay aware of what's happening at your property and make adjustments as necessary to address any new or changed security threats. Don't hesitate to ask for help from security professionals when needed. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. Please consider me to be a resource as you plan and implement the security program at your multifamily property. Feel free to contact me by phone or email if you have any questions. Please stay safe and secure.